13. Yes, sir. We're going to look at verse 47 and verse 48. If you have any trouble following me, I'm in the New Revised Standard Version tonight. But it's going to be pretty close. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, when it was full, they drew to shore, sat down, and put the good into the baskets, but threw out the bad. Let's look at verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the public reading of your word. We ask your blessing upon the message. Let us hear with ears of the Spirit. Let us perceive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Matthew 13, we're looking at the finality of seven parables. Seven parables that Jesus begins to introduce the understanding or the idea of the kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are... For the sake of those of you that I know study, there are various ideas about rather the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is the same or it's different. Most uh, of the ancient theologians, they're going to agree that kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is uh, synonymous, but what we have is a Jewish audience and a Gentile audience, specifically that of Luke's gospel, which is the kingdom of God, and then Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven, a Jewish audience. Rather that's correct or not, maybe that's beside the point. But what I want us to look at tonight is that at the end of Matthew 13, we get to the seventh of kingdom parables, and Jesus begins to talk about how the kingdom of heaven is like a net, a dragnet actually. Uh, one of the things you're going to find out about a dragnet is that it's a little bit different than net casting. It rather, it's the net that they drove behind the ship, and they would move through the ocean or the sea, and then when they got to the finality of where they were going, they would pull it out to see how many fish, or if they caught any fish, and I'm obviously, if there was a big load, as there was a few times in the Gospels, they wouldn't know it because it started tugging on the ship. Now, the word kingdom is something that we're going to have to become very, very much acquainted with in order for us to be successful in what God's called us to do. And a lot of times it doesn't necessarily mean that's, that everybody has to have the right definition because when we're living by the Spirit, we'll find out that most of the time people are operating from the kingdom regardless if they even know that or not. The kingdom, in short, is the king's dominion in the earth. So when we receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we have received the first fruits of our inheritance, and we have become the domain or the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means that it qualifies, I believe, what Paul says that the kingdom of heaven is not in meat, nor is it in drink, but it is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus had another time when being accused of casting out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebub, would say that if I by the Spirit of God, then another translator in um, another writer, rather it was Matthew or Luke or Mark, I'm not sure, would say by the finger of God. But if I by the finger of God or if I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, then no doubt the kingdom has come unto you. Now, what I want to do, first of all, is demystify this word kingdom because there's a lot speaking about it this day and age that is all over the place. From the idea of us going to get everything perfect and have a utopia before Jesus returns is hogwash. I don't know how else to say it. The kingdom is not about political regimes, but it is, again, it is about righteousness. The kingdom is about, I'm going to say it again, the kingdom is about righteousness. How are we made righteous? Well, we know Brother Steve has been teaching us about this. How are we made righteous? We know it's by God, by the Son, by the Spirit. But, but what allows us to access righteousness? Our faith. Yes, sir. 
It's our faith. Remember Abraham, the father of our faith, believed God, and because he believed God, even in light of a situation that seemed impossible, he was way beyond the ability to have children. His wife was way beyond her ability to have children, children. but yet they believed God, and because they believed God, it was accredited or accounted to him for righteousness. Him being the father of our faith, we are to do the same because he was a shadow or he was a prefiguring of that which was to come so that it's by the faith of Abraham that the many are made righteous because it is his righteousness that he shows. It's the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus by the faith of Abraham, the one who believed against all odds, which gave him the accreditation that he was righteous even before Jesus came. Which is, which is just amazing to me. That there were men of the Old Testament that before the cross would have eyes to see beyond their present age. To see beyond their present circumstances. To see beyond their present situations. That what they presently see is not the finality of all things, but understanding that even in its most um, smallest form, he could see that if he was blessed with the promised son that through his seed, as the father had made the promise, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that he was able to see beyond the present moment. And how did he get here? Well, God would become his friend because Abraham became his friend. And what do friends do? They share things with each other, don't they? They share things with each other and sometimes I think we can get into this place where God begins to talk to us, and if he's sharing something with you, we want to immediately tell everybody about it. I think that's what Paul was alluding to when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, I believe it was, when he said, I knew a man about 14 years ago, such a man caught up to the third heaven, who heard things that was not lawful for him to utter. I'm not sure if it means he can't say what he sees, it's just because he can't explain it, or rather that he knows that if he became the friend of God, that being the friend of God may mean that God may share some secrets with you that perhaps he wants you to keep to, him, to, keep to yourself until maybe in a point in time when he says, okay, son, okay, daughter, now you can share with, with my people. Because there's a scripture also that says, God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. But today's so-called prophets, the moment that they think they got a new revelation, they don't, they don't allow it to be judged. They don't bring accountability into their life. They get on Facebook and they, and, and they blast it like it's the sure word of God. It's dangerous. But I find that friendship means that it is a two-way street. Ethan, sit still. Get st sit still. Get your feet in. Sit down, son. Thank you. Friendship is a two-way road. How would you like it if somebody, well, maybe we've all known that person, that they're your friend the moment that you see them again or they call you on the phone, they share everything that they're going through, and you don't get but a few words in edgewise, and then the moment you try to share back with them, they say, well, i got to go. Something's going on. Somebody's calling me or the kids are hungry, and then that's it. And then that's a cycle. Well, that's not a real friendship, is it? A real friendship means that there is communication back and forth. There is deep empathy and heartfelt feelings towards that other person. So that not only do you speak and you share the secrets and the mysteries of your life, but you listen to the secrets and the mysteries of their life. This is what Abraham had with God. He was the friend of God. He had relationship with God, even so much so that when it came time that God looked upon Sodom and Gomorrah and he said, I'm done with this mess. I'm about to take it out. He, but you know what he said? He said, wait a minute. Shall I hide from my servant, Abraham, his friend? Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? So he comes in a theophany. There's the three Elohims in the Hebrew, the three El Elohims in the Hebrew, come. that's Trinitarian by the way, they come down and Abraham comes out to meet with them and they begin to have a conversation. This is right when he's about to get the blessing, the promise that Isaac would be born in a year's time. This is where Sarah laughs. So I did not laugh, but oh yes, you did laugh. And then of course they name him Isaac, which means laughter. He said, will I hide from Abraham? 
The conversation continues while the other two angels, or in the Hebrew again, it's the word Elohim, goes on to Sodom and Gomorrah because fire and brimstone is about to rain down, but Lot, who's right, somehow he's still righteous in God's eyes. It says right, Lot's righteous soul was vexed, and they're going to go get him out. But God is speaking to Abraham, and he's telling him what he's about to do, and Abraham begins to talk back. He said, wait a minute, God, are you telling me you're going to wipe out the city if there's 50 righteous? No, 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 Abraham. Actually, I will not if there's 50 righteous, but he didn't find 50 righteous. What about 10 righteous? What about five righteous? Well, we get all the way down that there was one righteous in his family who was connected to him. We talk about household salvation here. It doesn't mean that everything's just going to be peaches and roses, but at the end of the day, before the fire could come, his family was taken out. But God is in communication with Abraham, and God has inclined his ear to the words and the thoughts and the ideas of a man to see what he thinks about it before he even executes his plans. Where are the intercessors today? The ones that Ezekiel said would stand in the gap and make up the hedge. I think sometimes we see ourselves in God's army simply as soldiers awaiting instructions and orders. And there's a truth to that. Paul alludes to it more than once. But Paul also alludes to the fact that though we are his servants, we are his sons and we are his daughters. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Speaking to those who were the most intimate with him. Those who walked with him those three and a half years. And so Jesus made his mysteries known to his twelve in ways that he did not make known to the crowd. He spoke in parables according to Matthew chapter 13. He says the reason being, he told them another parable. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong place right here. Let me turn the other page here. He says... Um, Verse 13, he says, The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart is grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But then he says, but blessed are your eyes, speaking to the twelve, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear. And the scriptures go on to say that without a parable, he did not speak to them anything. He spoke to them in a way that they could hear the simple reality of their life journey. As we're in Matthew 13, we begin to look at the parable of the sower. We begin to look at um, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearls, and then the seventh, the parable of the dragnet. It seems like what we're seeing here is there is a vision for global evangelism, but maybe not in the sense that we may be inclined to think. Because oftentimes when we think evangelist, we think Reinhard Bonnke or somebody that's, that had been in Africa and, and they preach and millions come. And no doubt, that is a God-called gift, uh, the Doma gift, Ephesians 4, of the evangelist. But evangelism is an aspect of every single individual that's been baptized into the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Evangelism becomes the very part of our existence. And before you start beating yourself up, I'm not saying that what we're looking to do is be the person who can't sleep at night because we feel guilty if we didn't tell somebody and try to force a decision upon them. I believe that's just as dangerous as in never saying anything at all. I took the boys to the springs. We... Road, Holmes Creek. We got to the springs, and I was about ready to go. I was listening to an audio book, so I'm listening. And there was a lady over here that asked me about it. Strike up a conversation. I'm seeking to, to discern where she's at. I find out that she had been involved with New Age practices. She had been involved with different ideas of Eastern religions. But then I heard her say, well, I listened to this particular author. It was actually a book that I had read. 
And she said it made me hungry to start reading the Bible. I saw a way. I saw, I saw a road, right? Another lady comes out and joins the conversation. She interrupts the whole thing, and she starts arguing because she feels like I didn't come to present the gospel the way she thinks it should be presented. She scares this other lady away. She's going with that, 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 the type of ministry that, have you broken the commandments, and by your own admonition, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. And I'm going to tell you something, church. Most people are already living in a state of hell, and they know that hell is a destination because most people are already tormented in their own minds. And we must understand that there is a way to evangelize that can bring forth fruitful effects, and that fruitful effects can begin to help us grow the body of Christ. But it may not be as forceful sometimes as we think it is. There's only one way to God the Father, and His name is Jesus Christ. But do you not know that every single human being that has met Jesus for real all came from different walks of life, they all came out of different styles of sin and different forms of living. Some people have a story about being delivered and rescued out of drug abuse. I've heard testimonies of people that came out of Satanism. I've heard testimonies of people that come out of alcoholism, people who are rich, people who are middle class, people who are poor. They all have a different story to tell. And I have found that the work of the Holy Spirit will work with an individual wherever they are at so that whatever they're in, they can find the cross so that they can find the Father. Are you hearing me? Because it is the brazen serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness that where Israel's desires and their rebellion had unleashed the serpents to strike them and they were dying by a deadly poison called sin. And it was when they looked to the brazen serpent on the pole that Moses lifted up between heaven and hell that they looked and they were healed. And if we are going to successfully bring people into the church, we know there's only one way in, and his name is Jesus. But if we're going to be able to be effective in evangelism, we're perhaps we're going to have to be able to listen long enough to where the person's at so that we can find a way by the Spirit to bring them to the cross so that with their own eyes they can behold He who taketh away the sins of the world. And there they come into birth and through the church, which is the mother of us all, according to Galatians, the Apostle Paul. But if we immediately unload our guns to tell them how bad of a person they are, how God hates them and hates their sin and the only way He's going to love you is if you immediately repent. These people are going to be like, who do you think you are? Because at the very moment that the Holy Spirit, who is a gentleman, is massaging the hardness of this person's heart, getting them ready for the pure seed of salvation to take consent or inception so that they can conceive and conceive the kingdom in them, that there will always be somebody that's going to come like the two thieves on the cross. One one says, if you're God, if you be the Son of God, come down from here. The other one says, be quiet. This man done nothing wrong. But simply turn to him and said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Salvation came to that thief, not because he said the right things. Salvation didn't come to that thief because he was able to get off the cross and get baptized first. And I know it was before the, the resurrection. Or well, we serve a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even Abraham, who was in the place of the part of Hades, that was a Abraham's bosom, a resting place, he was still in a state of death waiting, but even in that state of death, he was accredited in righteousness because of his faith. And this was a man on the cross that had enough faith to turn and say, remember me. Why? Because he could see who he was hanging there. And I think sometimes we have this idea that if we can make somebody repeat a magical prayer, and if, like I say, it's a magical spell, that if we say it just right, get all your words just right, repeat it perfectly after me, they're going to be saved. And many people can repeat a prayer and go right back out doing the same thing they've always done because there's not been any change in the heart because instead of allowing the Spirit to lead, we have become forceful in our presentation.
It amazes me. St. Augustine in the 4th century said, God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but He has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. John Wesley, the great revivalist, one of my heroes, said, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Whew. How about this one? The Jews of Thessalonica, Acts 17, verse 6, part B. These people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. Talking about the apostles. How did evangelism how did the church explode in Acts 2? Well, first of all, you have to understand that God always starts something significant with a small group. We call this a remnant. We call this a seed. Unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground, Jesus will say, it abideth alone. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it brings forth what? Much, much fruit. So it had to be after the resurrection. That's why Matthew 28, verses 17 and 18, after the resurrection, Jesus would say to his disciples, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Take note of this. Heaven and earth. Son of God, Son of Man. The Anthropos, the God-Man. He is all God, all authority, or all power in heaven. But because he came to the earth and where man had lost dominion in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, where man had received dominion, which is not the dominion that looks like kings ruling over subjects. Rather, it is a dominion where we look at stewardship over this planet and over the animals and over the, over the, the beautiful creation of God that he's given us to steward, not destroy. In Genesis 3, because of sin... That dominion mandate was corrupted, and it wasn't long after that that sin abounds because the very first murder happens because of jealousy between two brothers over a religious sacrifice. Not much has changed. Jealousy, envy, self-seeking glory. How about James 3.16? As we have learned... Where there is envy and strife, or selfish ambition, another translation says. There's confusion in every evil work. So we're not going to be like that. We're going to understand that there's a parable of the kingdom that teaches us that if we learn how to figure it out through a way of unity... Not uniformity, that doesn't mean you act like me or I act like you, but unity is not uniformity. That when there is a unity amongst those that God has called and placed together in His care, in His house, there's a networking. And as a net works, every joint supplies according to Paul of Ephesians chapter 4, somewhere around verse 16, I do believe. What is a net? A net is a bunch of ropes tied together, knotted. Each knot represents a single individual that is moving in one mind, come on, Acts chapter 2, and one accord. The fellowship drags the net. Jesus, the captain of our salvation, should be driving the ship, and he has called people from every nation, every tongue, every every culture, to come together, tie together, and our common unity is the Son of God. Yes. Our common unity is the Son of God. 
And to be effective as who we are, we can't lose sight of, number one, who He is, so that we will not lose sight of who we are. And that means each and every one of us has specific individual gifts, and you are not called to change what God's made you to be. So in other words, what God's given you to share with the church is not to change. We have to find a way to incorporate what God wants to do amongst all of us because every one of us shares something to express and each one of us is still here, which means that we are not trying to change ourselves in order to have something new, but rather we find a unity that's in that one shared common fellowship so that together our individual expressions of God's image and likeness in this earth comes together and that's the new thing. That's what's going to be beautiful. I don't know of any churches that are doing it like that. Honestly, not really. It's either one way or the other. But what happens when we can find joy in each other's expression of worship? What happens when we can find joy in the expression of each one of our gifts and not trying to change that but incorporate who we are and who God's called you to be into this many-colored garment like Joseph's coat of many colors? Can we have a vision for something that is not down the road? Because we don't want to be like the down the road because the down the road's already there. So they've, why would we want to be like them when we're called according to his purpose and what they may be doing down the road may be beautiful, but that's what they're doing. What if God's calling us to do something so unique, so distinct, so creative that people are not even going to understand what's going on when we stand up here and we sing one of the most newest one you know say say god gives cain in a song and it's an expression of such beautiful worship and we enter in but the next thing you know that another expression of the gift of god in this house stands up and begins to sing consider the lilies they neither plant nor they sow maybe i got the words wrong but you know what i mean because in matthew 13 we read that a wise scholar of the kingdom remember King's Dominion, goes into the storehouse and he brings out both old things and new things. And sometimes, church, the new thing that God is wanting to do may not be the old thing like we think. It might be even older than what we are. That's why I said out with the old and in with the older. Because there's things that we've forgotten that's been lost and we need the teaching gift like it's on our brother right here, a true teaching gift. That he's going to go into the old things. He's going to dig into the old and he's going to mine it for truth that's relevant for today. That's going to help us have foundation to stand on today. Then there's going to be prophetic voices. That's going to go into the future to see what God's doing. So that on the wake of the future, breaking into the present, we can say just like Peter did in Acts 2, this is that. There was only 120. The world hadn't yet been turned upside down. This was that that was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. All flesh, sons and daughters prophesy? Come on, Peter, there's only 120 up here. No, he wasn't looking by what he could see in front of him. He was looking beyond that through prophetic vision of the seed of something that's going to break forth into our today from our tomorrow. We have to have a church, and I believe that we do, of men and women that are still here that's going to seek God for wisdom because the moment this becomes about Shane Mason is the moment I don't need to be here. We got too many pastors that think it's about them. It's not about me. It's not about you. Ultimately, it's about Jesus and Jesus is interested in his many-membered body. What happens when evangelism looks like a group of people that could be so diverse in some ways, but we all share the same Father and we all glow with the same glory because it's the glory of God that arrives upon us. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise and shine, church, for your light has come and the glory of God is risen upon you. There's going to be such beauty. I've been accused of many things in various ways, and sometimes most of it comes through straight ignorance. 
People, all they have to do is take a careful search into my Facebook and you can see different places I've been through, different groups of people that I've been with, different denominations that I have fellowship with. And can I say that what I have done and where I have been when it comes to the things of God has never been about blending in. It's always been about understanding that whatever belongs to the Lord belongs to me. Whatever belongs to the Lord belongs to you. And that if there is treasure to find in the storehouse that's old and new, I have went and I've sought out the ancient roads, the ancient paths. I've went beyond the last 500 years and I have found myself becoming alive, quickened by the Spirit in the patristics of the first 400 years of the church history. Men who have forgotten more than we have learned, all put together, that's just the truth, I promise you. Men such as Athanasius the Great who would say, what was God being good to do when His creation has sinned? Talking about Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve, when His good creation, not bad creation, His good creation, God called them good. And even after they sinned, church, we think that it caused God to change His mind about us. But we don't understand what we're talking about because sin does not change God's mind about you. Sin changes your mind about God. And Jesus steps on the scene and He says, You have heard of sin, but let me tell you who my Father really is. Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Adam and Eve sin. They hide. God still shows up for the walk, doesn't He? Adam, where are you? Sin will kill everything it touches. The wages of sin is death. It pays its own wages. And this thing called the gospel is a rescue story to snatch us from the impending doom so that we may hate the garments even taken and stained with the flesh. Well, we don't hate sin because we're scared to death of a father that's really the image of our earthly father that we projected onto God. Well, we hate sin because we love him. And sin destroys everything it touches. Anybody's ever heard of Oswald Chambers? Really? Phenomenal author, Protestant. Wrote a lot of books on prayer. One of the books he wrote, his, My Utmost for His Highest. It's like a daily devotional. I think something like 365 days. It's one all around the world. Oswald has to say this about evangelism. When our Lord said to the disciples, Follow me, and I will make fishers of men, Matthew 4, 19... His reference was not to the skilled angler, you know, an angler, fisherman, but to those who use the dragnet, something which requires practically no skill. The point being that you do not have to watch your fish, but you have to do the simple thing and God will do the rest. The pseudo-evangelical line is that you must be on the watch all the time and lose no opportunity of speaking to people. And this attitude is apt to produce the superior person. Did you hear me? This attitude is apt to produce the superior. Oh, I do this. You don't do this. Or you and I'm doing this. I'm the one doing this. Um, well, how effective are you in doing this? Because there's grandma sitting at home that's weeping and praying that's doing more than what we could ever do. One man said, and I don't remember who it was, but I'm sure we've all heard it, that we've heard the idea or the story that preached the gospel and used words when necessary. What does the scripture say? That he would inscribe upon tables of flesh our hearts the law of God written, beheld by A-L-L, all men. I say this jokingly, but the word all in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, it still means all. All men will see whether or not we walk the walk. All men will see whether or not we just talk and talk. But when our walk lines up with our talk, then perhaps men will hear what comes out of our mouth. Salvation ultimately is the work of the Spirit because the Son is already to tell us die, finished the work on the cross. So He sends the Spirit to what? 
convict the world of sin, to convince us of righteousness and of judgment because the prince of this world has been what? Judged. So in other words, no man comes to the Father lest the Spirit what? Draws him. So evangelism has to begin with us being led by the Spirit because some people are not yet ready. Some people's ground has not yet been made fertile. But there are people in our lives every single day that perhaps, I know some of us may have various differences in the way we live our lives, the people that we know, but you've got to think about it kind of like this. What would happen if we were able to affect in a positive way the five people that are not saved that we know of, that we can think of, five people that aren't living, or five people that's given up on Jesus, five people that may have been to church at one time, but they gave up because they've been hurt, because they've been ridiculed, they've been ostracized, and now they're on the, on the living edge? Uh, what are we doing to snatch them back in? Because the five people and that we influence... The five people that is the metron, the measure, the spear of our authority of where we live and where we exercise each day of our life in. We have more influence upon them than what we may even realize. When I saw this, this young lady that told me because she heard me listen to a Christian book, began to tell me about where she had been. I saw an inroad when she told me I read a book, and that book caused me to start wanting to read the Bible again. I did get enough information to her before I was abruptly interrupted by somebody wagging the finger saying, you're going to hell now. I was able to tell her about a few books that I believe would help her that would point her to Jesus. Remember what I said? Jesus is the only way. To the Father, which means there's no other way to heaven. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But she has been searching, and by the mercies and the grace of God, she has found herself wanting to read the Scriptures. And now it is the work of the Spirit to draw all men unto me. What does he say? If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Oswald goes on to say, it may be a noble enough point of view. What's that? The pseudo-evangelical line is that you must be on the watch all the time and lose no opportunity of speaking to people. And this attitude is apt to produce the superior person. It may be a noble enough point of view, but it produces the wrong kind of character. It produces pride, oftentimes. It produces arrogance. It does not produce a disciple of Jesus. But too often it produces the kind of person who smells of gunpowder and people are afraid of meeting him. According to Jesus Christ, what we have to do is watch the source. Who's the captain of our salvation? Jesus would say in his earthly ministry, I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what I see my father do. Watch the source, and he will look after the outflow. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oswald Chambers on our ultimate refuge, Job and the problem of suffering. I'm about to close, church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer a German theologian and pastor who was murdered under Adolf Hitler's regime. Did much work of rescuing and preserving as many Jewish people as he could during the Holocaust. Very active in his evangelism. Very active in his ministry. Gave his life for the gospel. Literally would not renounce him. Would say Jesus himself did not try to convert the two thieves on the cross. He waited until one of them turned to him. Wow. Who's in your life waiting for you to be a light? Because the Holy Spirit knows how to get them in a situation where they're going to look for an answer. I had somebody reach out to me today, was not worried about Jesus, has not been worried about church, and said, please pray for me. I'm going through something. What happens right there? Sometimes the Spirit will allow 
extreme, most of the time I believe actually, will allow extreme situations to come upon certain individuals so that the individual will look and turn towards the cross and what if you're the only person that they're going to be able to see Jesus in? They're going to turn to you. And there the heart's been made ready through suffering. There the heart's been made ready knowing that they are afraid and they don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. And as we've heard many times, there is no atheist in a foxhole. I think I heard Brother Steve say that Sunday. So our ability to evangelize is not as much about us trying to go to person to person, wearing ourselves out, hoping that we'll find one person that the Spirit has been working on, but rather the way the early church grew rapidly. 120 in that upper room. Peter preaches the message, 3,000 added. And then he added, the Spirit added daily to the church which was needed. How? They continued in four specific keys. In Acts chapter 2, it says that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teachings, in the breaking of bread, and in fellowship, and in prayers. Those are the four keys to a movement. We want revival. We want a movement. We want to become a people that is moving in Him we live In Him we move, Acts 17. In Him we have our being. And the people that have come from different walks of life, so different in maybe appearance, so different maybe in our upbringing, but if they bow their knees and they're serving the one true God through His Son Jesus Christ, they're our brother and our sister. And there again is our common union, our communion. Our common union, our communion, our fellowship. And together, we will drag the net just by living a life in the place God has put you, shining, being a light, and preserving, being salt. And the church will explode. Let's pray tonight. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, seal this word in our hearts. Help us to chew on it. Help help us to meditate as we were learning in Sunday school last Sunday. This book of the law, as Joshua 1 and 8 says, shall not depart out of your mouth, but we shall meditate in it day and night so that we may observe and do all according that's written therein. Then we will make our ways prosperous. Then we shall have good success. Lord, help us to know you. Reveal your Son in us. Show us the way so that in our life, whether we're at Walmart, whether we're on a job, whether we're going down to the feed store, let us shine. Because there will be somebody that needs you, and so you send us somebody that's hurting, somebody that's broken, somebody that feels like they have nothing else to lose and on the point and the verge of giving up. Help us to be aware of our present so that we can observe those that are hurting, those that have been made ripe for the harvest so that souls will continually be added to your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, church says amen, amen. Amen.